you can now start the meeting. Well, welcome everybody and uh, these funny old times that we are in and it's good to see you all. I start with an apology. I put on my special Kapiti Council aftershave this morning and realised that that was not going to be effective at all. So, uh, but if you keep smelling, you might just smell it. Anyway, we'll start with the council blessing. As we deliberate on the issues before us, we trust that we will reflect positively on the communities we serve. Let us all seek to be effective and just so that with courage, vision and energy, we provide positive leadership in a spirit of harmony and compassion. Do we have any apologies? No apologies. We have an apology from His Worship the Mayor. Okay. Would someone uh, second that apology? All in favour? Against. Thank you. Any declarations of interest relating to the agenda? No. No declarations of interest. All right, uh, would we now move into public speaking where we have Mr. Dunmore? I'll just let Mr. Dunmore in the meeting now. Good morning, Mr. Dunmore. Can you hear us? Mr. Dunmore, you just need to unmute yourself. All right, yes, I can hear you. And my video should be working, that looks better. Can Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Dunmore, and Good. thank you for the effort you've put into your presentation. So, Mr. Dunmore, just for your information, you will have three minutes to present to the committee. Um, I will notify you at the end of those three minutes that your time is over, and then the, through the chair, members will be able to ask you questions. Is that okay? So, if you'd like to unmute yourself, we can start your time now. All right. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to, to join the committee. I'm presenting as an individual. Um, and uh, I've got a long-standing interest in audit and risk uh, because of my career as a professor of accounting. Um, I've given you a submission, which I hope you've, you've got. Um, I won't go through that in detail. In fact, I'm going to approach it the other way around because the discussion of self-insurance, I think, is probably more urgent. And the uh, material that I've presented on the risk management framework, I think, is really a suggestion for improvement in future years. Um, so with your permission, I'll start by talking about the uh, self-insurance. The essential thing for you to understand is that self-insurance is not insurance. Um, and until that is clear, uh, all of this is going to be very confusing. If there's $100 million damage to council assets, council loses $100 million, less whatever you can get back from independent insurance companies uh, from outside of the council's consolidated accounts. Uh, if there were a self-insurance fund, then when you've got a big loss, you could draw on the cash uh, before you have to start borrowing to, uh, to repair the, the damage. Um, that doesn't reduce your loss. It's still 100 million less whatever you get from the insurance companies. Um, but uh, it, and, and in practice, borrowing is not likely to be very difficult, but it, it does have some slight benefit. Um, but as far as it's possible to tell, there is no self-insurance fund. Um, according to the audited financial statements from the last financial year, um, I drew your attention, in fact, to a quote from note 13, uh, which says explicitly that council does not run a, uh, a, a, an insurance fund. Instead, what there appears to be, uh, and as mentioned in the officer's report to you today, is that there appears to be a notation in the internal accounts uh, saying that 0.3 million 
of the 500 and something million equity is designated as being an insurance reserve. The council has an insurance reserve. That means all that there is, is a note in the accounts saying that of the 500 million equity, 0.3 million is called an insurance reserve. There is nothing real in that. There is nothing that reduces council's risk. There is nothing that brings in any money if council suffers a loss. So it's harmless. It doesn't do any good, but it doesn't do any harm. Staff are proposing to investigate setting up a captive or protected uh, cell uh, entity to take the self-insurance risk for council. Um, if this were wholly owned, it would have no effect that is different from a self-insurance reserve. The entity would be consolidated into the financial statements and it would simply be uh, what, whatever it owns would be treated as being part of council assets. And uh, it would be very much equivalent to a bank account uh, containing money for, a, um, uh, for uh, insurance payout, uh, except for any administrative frictions. And there would be administrative frictions. It would have to be set up, it would have to be managed and so forth. Um, if it were jointly owned with other councils, then uh, the risk would be shared with those other councils, which means if Capity suffered a loss, the other councils would bear some of the cost, and that's good for Capity. But it also means that if there's a loss in some other district, Capity bears some of the cost also, so which is bad for Capity. So again, there's the, the risk doesn't magically go away. Mr. Dunmore, your three minutes has ended. My time is up. All right. Um, Insurance is simple. If you don't understand what the what is being done, then don't go with it. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. Right, uh, questions of Mr. Dunmore, please. We don't seem to have any hands up, Mr. Chair. Right. Well, thank you, Mr. Dunmore appreciate your expertise and i'm sure we'll be taking into account your comments thank you thank you for your attention sir Are there is there any members business that hasn't been notified at all all right if not we'll move straight into the reports and um, the first report is the insurance overview happily. So Ian, I think you were taking us through that. Yep. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, everybody. So firstly, I'd just like to introduce um, our colleagues from Aon. So we've got um, Brett O'Malley and Arnie Tefaitia on the call. Um, so I'll call on them to comment um, as we go through this, but you've got the paper in front of you. Um, and essentially what, it's, what it does is summarise the insurance renewals from 2021 and then also proposes that we do explore further the concept of self-insurance. Um, so by way of background, we're, we're, part of, we're party to a collective along with Upper Hutt, Hutt Pororua and Greater Wellington Councils and Aon advise us and are brokers for that group. So we were able to successfully renew our insurances um, during 2021. The key um, policies and features of those policies, um, the limits, deductibles, et cetera, are summarized in the table um, at paragraph 11 in your paper. Um, I guess the issue, and, and those um, covers are, are consistent with what we've carried in recent years. I guess the continuing challenge that we have in the insurance space is the, is the escalating cost of cover. And to try and mitigate that in this most recent renewal, we did a couple of things. We, um, as part of the um, renewal process, we explored with insurers um, the options of taking higher levels of deductible to try and understand if we carried more risk ourselves by way of higher deductibles, what the premium um, benefit might be around that. And basically the, the response to that was not positive. So the insurers really didn't offer um, Either, either didn't offer alternative terms or very little premium deductions um, for taking the higher deductible. And I guess that simply reflects the fact that their, their risk, I guess, is at the major loss um, end of the spectrum. And so, and it, you know, deductibles of an extra 500k or million or whatever don't sort of change the major risk that they're carrying. So we didn't have uh, much luck there. 
Um, but the other area that we explored was just looking at the lower value assets and whether there were items that we could um, self-insure or uninsure if, if self-insure is not the right term, but basically remove from the insurance schedules. And um, where we got to there was, was we ended up um, identifying um, a lot of lower value assets. So in particular, um, we're talking about things like playground equipment, um, small value structures, toilet blocks, um, just a range of minor assets, I guess, that were spread right across the district where we felt um, really the likely that, that they weren't critical assets to us um, in, in, a, in a loss event and the likelihood of um, suffering a, a loss, you know, significant loss across that those minor assets, given the nature of them and the fact that they're so widely spread was difficult to um, imagine. And so we ended up uh, dropping those assets off and they totaled um, around 40 million in, at replacement value. And we did achieve some premium benefit from that. Um, looking forward, um, we're keen as we go into the next renewal, which is the major policies renew in May. So we're not far away from that process, but we are keen to explore further this idea of, um, of, of self-insurance. And so what we have is currently, as Mr. Dunmore's just noted, is a self-insurance reserve, which is on our balance sheet. So we have rated for that. So, so included in our budgets and our, and our rating, there's, there's an, an allowance for a contribution to the self-insurance reserve. So it's money which ratepayers have funded. And we have um, identified that, set it aside as a reserve on our balance sheet. So he's correct in that regard. Um, the, it's not separate money. So we haven't got a separate bank account held representing that 300K. It's basically netted against uh, other council funds. And looking forward, what we're wanting to do is explore um, more formal options, I guess, around that. Um, and so um, there are a range of options and I'll ask Brett just to come in and comment or talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but there are a range of options that would take us to a more formal approach, separating the reserve from council and setting it up an alternative entity so that it was, as I say, independent, would have its own funds and would be a more um, formal arrangement. And Brett, I might at that point just ask you to come in and comment. Hi, thanks, Ian. Um, so the two options we've been discussing with uh, Ian and Mark uh, predominantly around a captive, which is effectively an insurance company which the council would own, or a protected cell, which again is a separate insurance vehicle, uh, but it's more of a rent captive. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot less administrative requirements and regulatory burden. Um, we propose that we do a feasibility study for these, uh, see if there is any benefit to the council, uh, and to understand the costs of setting these up and administering them. So I suppose the, the, um, the benefits are is it's a vehicle for you to better control the insurance costs. Uh, so since 2016, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, insurance costs have been rising quite dramatically, specifically in the Wellington region. Uh, and we are in a global uh, competition for insurer capital. Um, Wellington earthquake risk is seen as quite a large risk globally and we are reliant on those international markets to provide that capacity and that capital. Uh, and those costs have been rising, which unfortunately been passed on to the insureds themselves. So having one of these vehicles allows you to, in those rising markets, retain more risk, and then in the soft markets, push it back uh, into the insurance markets. Um, it does have other benefits. You are able to access reinsurance markets um, and Depending on the domicile you set up, there may be some tax benefits if council is able to claim from those. Um, one thing we are seeing is inflation, and it's causing a large increase in rebuild costs. So the assets that you are insuring, the cost of rebuilding those is going to go up. Those increased values will lead to an increased premium. So having these vehicles to be able to retain a bit more risk, and it may not be at the bottom end, you can choose to retain it at various places throughout your insurance program to get the maximum benefit. Uh, but those increased rebuild costs will have an adverse premium effect as well. Uh, so we do propose undertaking a feasibility study along with Capity Council uh, just to see if there is any benefit in setting up one of these insurance vehicles uh, for you to retain a bit more of your risk yourselves and perhaps lessen the reliance on external reinsurer or external insurers 
uh, and be such a, a victim of the fluctuations of the market. Thank you, Brett. Hmm. Questions of Ian and Brett? Anybody questions so far in this presentation? Gary Simpson with a question, Mr. Chair. Anything else? Yourself, Gary? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, one question. The idea of a captive, you're, you're suggesting that, that you do a feasibility study uh, relating to Kapiti forming a captive. Uh, given that you're part of the, um, the Outer Wellington Shared Services Insurance Group, wouldn't the logic of a captive be strengthened by being part of that group simply because the risk was shared and um, the potential costs are lessened. Obviously, as, as Mr. Dunmore said, if, if somebody else has the disaster, Kapiti pays, but if Kapiti has the disaster, um, uh, the others contribute. Um, what was the logic of looking at this feasibility study on the basis of Kapiti alone? Um, yeah, there would certainly be benefit in including others within the Outer Wellington groups uh, within the feasibility study. Uh, to date, of the other councils have shown an interest in getting down this line. Um, so that's why it's capital alone at this point. We will work out the other um, participants in the collective to see if they have any other interest. Yeah. I think I think that's that's right. We would certainly be talking with our colleagues, I think, as we went down this path. To just gauge their interest. Um, I'm not sure if Mark Mark had a, a comment to make. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Tanika. Um, good morning, everyone. Through you, Mr. Chair. Look, I, I would like to make a statement uh, right at the end after questions have been made. So I know Councillor Compton's got a question. So I'd like to. Just basically um, make a statement after the questions have been answered. Yeah, that, that's fine. Councillor Compton. Um, thank you. Through the chair, a couple of questions from me. I guess the first one's uh, picking up on Gary's point. Um, we obviously tend to look south towards Wellington generally, um, and that makes sense in terms of us being part of the Greater Wellington grouping and all that. But will consideration be given in terms of that feasibility study of looking at whether we go in with councils that have a similar, more similar risk profile to us, like um, Horofanua District Council, or those sorts of things, where there's a, we're not necessarily going to be caught up in the um, significant or quite as significant earthquake risks that, say, Wellington and Hutt City in particular are facing in terms of their insurance premiums, and whereas we have you know, some different risk profiles up here. So would we be looking at other councils that might be in a similar position to us rather than going in with a big metro that has potentially billions of dollars of liability coming its way? That's the first question. Uh, yeah, there's certainly been discussions around um, perhaps joining in with Horofenua councils. Um, I think from their perspective, they we probably need to further those discussions. I think they are concerned about the earthquake risk that Capiti might pose to them. Uh, so they would have to obviously accept you into their collective as well. It's not a um, simple matter of just saying you want to be in and uh, being in there. Cool. But um, we can. So my, my second question was, I know... Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Councillor, can I... Um, sorry. Um, just the, uh, the negatives of being on Zoom. Um, look, just to add to what Brett um, has said, um, look, we... We've done that. Um, about three years ago, we tabled a paper with, with, with the Audit and Risk Committee, and um, we absolutely, after the Kakora earthquake um, and the tightening of the market, we, we were extremely worried about our associated risk and um, our, um, our, underground, our underground assets are insured entirely offshore. From an underwriter's perspective, our natural boundaries, we are deemed to be in Wellington. Um, so we, um, if we wanted to lift and shift, we've spoken to a couple of um, other syndicates. Um, we've identified a couple of syndicates in the country that we 
we actually thought would be um, <clears throat> very advantageous to join. And um, through Aon, we facilitated a number of meetings with them. And actually what, what transpired is that our syndicate within the Wellington region is light years ahead of everybody else. And actually we agree, we agree our pre, but we have a, um, it's all or nothing. So we have a rule that if you're in the syndicate, um, we have to do loss modeling, we have to do critical um, network assessments, we have to do undertake studies, we have to position ourselves the best when we go to our offshore underwriters. Um, we agree how we allocate the premiums. Um, yes, that does in itself create some tensions and we navigate our way through that. But in, in terms of how we operate as a syndicate, it's an all or nothing. And what we actually learned with other syndicates is they can't agree much. So they 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 way they way behind us. They don't they don't all participate um, 100%. But fundamentally, one of the things that is stopping us from actually lifting and moving is that the underwriters still deem us to be within Wellington. So the question becomes: Do we actually stand by ourselves? And and and, and, and you know, just to to respond to uh, Mr. Dunmore's um, earlier comment, um, insurance is not simple. And these are the things that we have to grapple with. And that is why we have brought this paper and that is why we want to further investigate a captive or a protective cell because you have, to, you have to continually make yourself attractive to the market. We are Wellington, we deem to be Wellington, we deem to be high risk. Um, our maximum probable loss is 130 million. Um, that's, that's if we have a natural disaster centered in Paraparat. We could sit back and say, well, actually, the loss modelling says that the, the major earthquake is going to be centred in, in Lower Hutt, and our damage is going to be 40 million. But we've got to do what's best for our community. So it's far from simple. And um, we believe that actually investigating the, the, the pros and cons of a captive or a protected cell, a protected cell is definitely the easier way to go. Um, that will make us more attractive to the market. That will make the underwriters see that we're being proactive to actually not just transfer the whole risk through insurance. And, um, you know, but discussions continue with our neighbours. Um, can we be by ourselves? Should we bring other players into the syndicate? But um, right now, we are deemed to be Wellington and we are at that risk of Wellington is attached to us. Well, I guess that actually brings up another question. <laughs> And that was going to be around, presume, well, are we sort of out on our own and in investigating this sort of thing or have other councils looked at doing this or has LGNZ got some, got some experience in dealing with this? Or, you know, are we breaking new ground or uh, presumably, <laughs> you know, the 78 other territorial authorities and regional councils, some, surely someone's um, looked at this in the past to, that we can perhaps look at to see what they've sort of, I guess, um, their experience has been so far if they've pursued it or not? Or is that something that we'll look to come through in the feasibility study? So through you, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> look, we're not breaking new ground. Um, in, terms of, in terms of our syndicate, you know, always looking at uh, ways and means of, of managing the, the cost of insurance premiums. Um, we are ahead. Um, captives are quite common. Uh, Transpower has its own captive. Wellington Airport has its own captive. Um, we, are, we are quite a large syndicate. We've got Greater Wellington involved in the syndicate for above ground assets. But um, we, we, are, we are proactive. And um, we give, um, I might hand over to, 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 to Brett, but we actually give Aon a really hard time. You know, we, we're constantly asking the question, how do, we, how do we bring our insurance premiums down? How can we get the best out of insurance? How do we be more attractive? Um, you know, for the last three years in a row, those premium increases are going up and there's no sign of them coming down. Um, last year, I think we had 11% insurance premium and there was, that, there was an 11% increase in insurance premium. That was a fantastic result. The um, very start of our discussions with Aon is they were signaling, you know, be prepared for a 30%. So um, in terms of our syndicate, Aon are having conversations with uh, members of the syndicate about, about a protective cell. Um, I would say, um, Kapiti, we have been probably, and, and Brett, feel free to, to correct me, but we've, we've been quite aggressive uh, with Aon, saying, look, we, we want to better protect ourselves. We don't want to be at the mercy of, of the market. What else can be done? And so we have been really pushing um, this concept of a protected cell versus a captive. Um, the, 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 alternative, the alternative is we could just sit back and, and um, 
um, go to our underwriters offshore, pay a forty percent um, premium increase, and have to have to rate have to charge rate pays for that. So we're we're constantly constantly looking at ways to to reduce our, our premiums. There are some concepts that Aon have put on the table for us, which um, which just won't work for us. So um, we've got a fantastic uh, relationship with Aon. And um, we constantly put them under pressure because we want to make sure that we're getting bang for buck. We're not over-insuring. We're not overcharging the rate payers, and um, we're attracted to the market. So, in terms of local government, I don't know a council that has got a captive or a protected cell. Yeah, but I guess within them, you've got, like you mentioned, Wellington Airport is obviously part owned by Wellington City Council. So there is some, presumably, understanding of it. I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, around here um, to our knowledge one other council in the country is um, investigating this as well uh, it's one of the larger um, city councils uh, but yeah capability have definitely been more proactive at looking at options uh, to manage and mitigate those insurance cost rises cool perfect thank you and um, thank you, one Rick. final question just picking up uh, point 32 on page 11 um, where it's got all financial impacts discussed in this report within the long-term plan budget allowances um, Presumably, Aon isn't going to uh, do this uh, feasibility analysis for free, or are they? Um, I'm guessing there must be some sort of cost for it, or are they feeling very generous? Uh, no, there will be a cost. Um, so we're getting that price now. We have a specialist consulting division who would uh, do this for us. Uh, cool. So we will have a feasibility study through as soon as possible. Uh, we will look to keep that as competitive as possible. Uh, I imagine it's not, it's not a great, uh, a fairly um, but there. It will be a fairly small cost in the scheme of our overall sort of insurance budget. Oh. Uh, however, Councillor Compton, you raise a good point. It would be good in future that uh, a cost is put into the recommendation just so that we get the, the total picture. Mark, you, you said you wanted to make a final statement. I guess we've had that, have we, or is there more to come? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, 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 um, the, the, the only last thing I'll, I'll add in, in response to, to Mr. Dunmore's analysis of our um, financial statements is um, that we have moved away over the last six years. We've worked very hard to um, close down and disestablish the jam jars that we used to have. So the self-insurance fund, is, as you've heard from the Chief Financial Officer, is, is recorded as a reserve. Um, we don't keep that money in a separate bank account. We don't do jam jar accounting, which is why it's appropriately sitting in equity. Thank you, Mark. Ian, your report, anything you want to add, subtract? No, nothing more for me. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'd like to thank you because the committee was keen to have a paper on insurance and uh, didn't probably realise how big a uh, cost it is to us when you look at at, uh, at all the details. So thank you very much for that. I know that um, that Gary had a, a few concerns. Have they been answered for you, Gary? Just for the benefit of the others, I um, queried whether. Um, the self-insuring of $40 million worth of assets was was worth $110,000 saving. Um, and, and Mark assures me that in, in the view of the officers, it is. Uh, and as I read the paper again, I um, can I just be certain that one of the thresholds for the items that will be covered by that self-insurance was a $200,000 cap, replacement cap. Is that a, is that a fixed criteria? for the inclusion or exclusion of items in that self-insurance. Uh, in, in, in terms of um, the items that we dropped off last year, that there was one, that was, there was sort of three categories. There was minor playground equipment. Um, then yep. there was toilet blocks. And then there was minor structures under 200,000. And so the, the, yep. that's where the 200,000 cap came in so so that picked up for example you know maintenance sheds and and, yeah, and yeah. minor structures around the place but the some of the toilet blocks would have been higher than 200k and potentially yeah, some sure. of the playground stuff as well but the 200 was specific to the minor structures okay all right uh, and the only other question i had in that regard is is uh, 
20, number 20 in the report, uh, there was reference earlier to the, um, to the self-insurance fund being, being rated for. Uh, but as I read that, it seems to me that what's rated for is the uh, insurance premium and the unspent parts form part of the self-insurance. Is that correct? Or are you specifically rating for um, the build-up of fund? It's, it's both. So we, 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 we rate for the premiums and we've got a separate um, budget line for the self-insurance contribution. So is it likely that that self-insurance fund will increase at a greater rate as, uh, as uncommitted insurance premium budgets go in as well as the rate and amount? That is possible. So council agreed um, during the LTP process that, that any unspent premium budget this financial year could go into the fund. They haven't taken a decision around future years, so that'd be a question for council if, okay. if savings okay. can emerge. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Mr. Chair, can I just add a comment? Would that be all right? Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't get my camera to turn on at the moment, but if I may um, add a comment. Uh, and it goes, it, goes, it goes a little bit to the um, interesting question about who you, who you work with and um, how widely you diversify um, your investments in things like insurance. Um, at, the, at, the, at the broadest extent, there was a, a vehicle called Risk Pool that all councils belonged to, and um, it was um, undertaken to effectively ensure that across the country through the combined resources of all councils. Um, but we discovered that when you're a minority member and you don't like the decisions that are being made, um, you do tend to suffer the results of, of those decisions. So we pulled out quite early on. Um, uh, we're still liable, though, for ongoing losses from that because it was effectively self-insuring. It was only very late in the piece that they started getting into the reinsurance market. That's not really my fundamental point. Um, my fundamental point goes to the way, um, even within our own little Wellington syndicate, premiums are allocated. And um, it's basically one of the allocation methods is um, the value of, of assets insured. So um, interestingly, other councils have long um, not insured some of their minor assets. Technically, the way that plays out, therefore, is Carpety, if it's insuring all of those minor assets that the others are not, our value of asset insured is slightly higher. So we're going to carry a slightly higher share of the premium. I wouldn't call it overly material, but, it, but what it should point out to you is that you, you do actually also have to consider what your colleagues are doing um, as part of how the insurance premiums will be allocated. It's not just risk, it's assets insured. So um, that's also a factor that um, didn't drive our decision to to take some of the low value assets out, um, but it certainly um, was something that we were aware of in making those decisions. And as a risk, you have to take account of if you um, don't want to do so. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Wayne. All right, we have a recommendation if there's no other comments or questions on page six. And for respect of time, I'll just move uh, all the recommendations in the reports if everyone's happy with that and just, uh, ask for all in favour. Sorry, um, Mr. Chair, we need a seconder for this. I, I don't think you do when the chair moves it normally, or is the uh, under council, is that different? I'm happy to second it, uh, Brian. Thank you. Uh, un un under council, we do, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. I'll have to take off my commercial hat, won't I? Uh, <laughs> all, all in favour. If I can get everybody, all the members to use their reaction buttons to, to vote. So we have four votes in favour, Mr. Chair. Against? It's passed. Thank you very much. All right. Ian, you're back in, back in, in the limelight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is the, um, the Ernst Young audit plan for the coming year. And um, I'll just introduce um, our colleagues from Ernst Young. We've got David Borry and Thomas Marshall on the call. And I'll just pass across to David to speak to his report. Welcome, David. Thank you. Um, and I'll be uh, reasonably brief, given we've got a reasonably well-established program of, of audit work. I'll just make a couple of comments to the executive summary, which is on page two of our report. 
uh, and it's page 16 of papers. We have our areas of audit focus in the top left of, of that page. Um, and they really represent the key components of council's income statement and balance sheet. Out of the areas of audit focus we've got there, maybe two points that are worth uh, highlighting in particular. They both relate to, to infrastructure assets. The first would be around the, the valuation of in infrastructure assets that are carried at fair value and they are revalued on a scheduled basis by independent valuers. For context this year, there are no scheduled revaluations, but one of the important considerations is that in any year where there are no planned revaluations, if it's anticipated that the fair value of a group of assets might differ to their carrying value, uh, revaluations should still be undertaken. So one of the important exercises that management is currently working through is that assessment, just to check that they are comfortable with not revaluing any particular group of infrastructure assets for, for this year end. The other point worth drawing attention to is probably around uh, Three Waters reform. Uh, so currently there's obviously some uncertainty in that space around the particular details of the reform program as that continues to be worked through and that uncertainty is likely to remain um, as at the, the council's year end and at the point the, the annual report is adopted. Really just wanted to make um, a comment about expectations in terms of um, financial reporting. And the expectation is that some commentary would be provided in the, the annual report around progress with that reform and some context from a capity perspective in terms of the potential impact, but acknowledge given the uncertainty, what can be said in that space is something that we'll work through with uh, management at that point in time once there's, there's better visibility. Um, the only other point I wanted to touch on in terms of the executive summary was in the top right of that page where we cover our audit approach um, and give some context around areas where we test council's controls as opposed to taking a completely substantive audit approach. Uh, the primary driver of uh, controls testing is really where there's a greater volume of transactions. We tend to take a, uh, an approach of testing controls in addition to substantive procedures. So around rates, uh, payroll, expenditure, those sorts of um, areas. But the lens we apply to that is what's going to generate the, the most efficient audit approach. Um, that's all I wanted to touch on in terms of the, the plan, but very happy to, to answer any questions that committee members have. Just uh, perhaps one from me, David. Um, the, your, I know you ordered a lot of councils. Uh, is there any particular way that councils are dealing with the three waters that we could learn from ourselves? Is there anything that's happening out there that um, uh, would make whatever the future is a bit easier for us? Uh, no, I mean, I think the key thing for, for councils is remaining constantly engaged in the process and the ways that are available to, to be engaged in that um, process. And I know that Capitis had significant um, involvement in terms of giving consideration to the reforms and participating in the ways that um, Capitis is able to participate. So I don't think I have anything extra from a practical perspective. Um, it's really more waiting to see where things are, are at come uh, adoption date for the, the annual um, report, given that the process won't have been completed by then. Thank you. Right, questions, please. Um, it doesn't look like we have any, Mr. Chair. You told me there'd be lots, Tanika, over this item. <laughs> All right, we'll move to the recommendation, which is on page 12, and uh, I'll move it. Do we have a seconder, please? Councillor Holbrook. All in favour? Could please use your vote buttons. And we have four in favour 
and I'm, I'm, I'm five, including yourself. Thank Mr. you. Yeah. Against, there's none. Motion is carried. Recommendation is carried. Thank you. Right, health and safety. Diane was waiting in the wings. Thought it would be an hour. We beat you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, ever hopeful. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I will just say that I take it as read that everyone's had a look at the report. There's nothing um, startling in the report for the October to December quarter. The trend continues that the space area tends to have the majority of incidents, and this has a, a direct correlation to the libraries and the aquatics. And given that the Waikanae pool season opened in November, um, this data is captured in that space as well. In terms of um, just generally overall, some things I just want to bring to your attention is just in the context of the health and safety environment and the purpose of putting this report together and capturing certain information. Um, there's not a specific section about how COVID-19 is impacting on our staff other than picking up through some of the behaviours that we're seeing experienced um, by our frontline staff from our customers and also from just the added pressures that people are under in their own lives and situations which then can flow over into the workspace. So I think it's, it's fair to say that we are very much aware that for a, to maintain a healthy and safe working environment for staff across the physical safety areas as well as the you know psychological well-being areas the SLT and the chief executive are putting a lot of work into this area and it is a key focus um, around the impacts of appropriate training and coaching appropriate support which isn't just about the um, EAP program it's it's also about um, you know, buddies and um, managerial support, and also the impacts that isolation is having on not only our ability to work as effectively when we're not working in our normal working environment, but also um, in terms of the isolation for those staff who may not have a lot of contact in their home environment and therefore that is impacting them and also on the contrary for those staff who have a home environment that's probably not 100% conducive to them working as effectively as they would like to and how that plays through um, when they are trying to do their work and wanting to meet their commitments for the organisation. So I think it's fair to say that although it's not captured in this report per se, that there is a lot of work behind the scenes going on to ensure that staff can do their roles and that they are not um, being exposed to undue pressures at, at this time, which is just totally unprecedented in, in our work experience. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, I think we all empathise with you. And uh, one of the questions that, um, that I had was uh, the cost, and I know it's unavoidable and we have to do it, and I've met some very pleasant security folk as I've gone around, libraries and et cetera. But at some stage, it would be quite nice to have a uh, the cost of this extra security so that we can have a visibility of what it has cost us. Because at some stage, it would be worth um, people actually knowing uh, this unbudgeted cost that we've had to uh, take aboard simply because of the behavior of, of the very people that um, we're trying to protect our staff from. And that, that's the only thing I'd like to see at some stage, nothing urgent. Okay, thank you. Uh, and can we get the right security people as well was the other question. Um, Mr. Chair, I think you, th you froze just for a moment there. 
I froze. <laughs> it's quite warm here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other question was, can we get the, um, the right security staff uh, for all our um, situations? I'll, I'll speak to that, Mr. Chair. Um, we are having, as part of the conversations that we are having at the moment, um, it's fair to say um, uh, we're not overly impressed with the quality of what's available uh, in security, and um, it's, a, it's a pretty tough gig, too, at the moment, as you might expect. So uh, there's a piece of work that uh, Mike Mendonca, our Group manager place and space is um, working on is the whole security um, environment that we're working in and that'll include having a look at whether there are better options for us to pursue in terms of who provides those services so 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 long story short we think it uh, needs to be improved if it can be and we're looking right across the spectrum at that thank you other questions please we have councillor buswell Thanks, um, thanks, Diane, for this report and things. Um, I'm just <coughs> wondering, um, you know, we've we've also got a, an issue with staff retention and things like that, and that's um, been highlighted for um, a wee while now. And I understand it's across the board in all sorts of industries. So, in terms of keeping our staff morale up and our group culture fun and exciting and interactive and supportive. What are we doing as an organization to, um, to really look after and nurture those kind of soft things in, in our organization? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have recently recruited a new role in my team, which has a focus on the wellbeing portfolio. And so there is quite a substantial piece of work going on at the moment looking at the current things that we do, which are which have become like a business as usual process, but also the add-ons around that um, that can sort of keep things on our radar and strengthen the work that we currently do. So um, again, going back, that's in terms of you know what what can we do what we've got now. Um, in terms of the retention uh, of staff, yes, it is across the board, it is everywhere. But what we are finding is that we're not, not able to get good staff per se. It's just taking us longer to find them because there is so much competition out there at the moment. And so one of the issues that we are looking at is, you know, obviously remuneration and costs, because as we know, central government, you know, just spends a lot of money um, on the same or some of the jobs that we have and, and our pockets, you know, aren't that deep. But what we've focused on is what are the good things that this council does for its staff that, that make it a great place to work. And that is around all those initiatives that we have done over the last 12 months around leave provisions, um, the way we manage our staff absences through COVID, we don't have black and white that, you know, you're not at work so you don't get paid, all of that, you know, we're not posing those restrictions and adding to people's further stress when things are happening to them that are out of their control. So we're sort of approaching it from that holistic perspective of it's a great place to work because we care, because we do, and we want to look after our people. And so that is quite a big piece of work, which has been um, led by our new organisational um, development advisor at the moment. And so, sorry, Diane, just to delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, so when people are being um, employed or interviewed, um, as part of their remuneration package and so forth, are these, are these positive things highlighted as an advantage to be working here? Because often people um, just look at the bottom line and look at how much money they're going to be paid. But... Um, you know, emphasising those those other soft values is, is really important too. Absolutely. Um, historically, we haven't always been that great at doing that because it's been such a 
such a benefit and such a bonus for people who live locally to work locally. But as we have seen with the um, increased work from home and remote technology and, you know, the agility around changing the way we we do things and deliver our services, that has become less of a, you know, a jewel in our crown. So we've started to focus on the additional things that we offer around the leave, around the support for staff and the flexibility around working hours. And yeah, using it, we don't sort of put it in the advertisements as such, but we use it in the discussions that we have as part of the the pre-employment and pre-interview process. And we get a lot of positive feedback from our candidates saying, well, that's really great. Well, that's really, that's really supportive because I, I struggle with that now, you know, because I can't, I don't have that flexibility with my current employer. So it, it's it's one of those things, I think it's just evolving. And, you know, the further we go on, the more we can see where are the things that we can consider that will actually make a positive difference and add value to our organisation being a great place to work. Sure, that's great. Thank you. Diane, do you have, and uh, you may not have the numbers exactly, but do you have the number of vacancies we have at the moment across the organisation? I don't have them off the top of my head, but it's, it's an excess of 20. Oh, thank you. Any other questions, please? All right, we have a recommendation on page 31. I shall move it. A seconder, please. Councillor Compton. Yes. All in favour? Against? Uh, sorry. Um, we have all in favour, Mr Chair. Thank you. Its resolution is passed. The recommendation is passed. All right. Risk management with Mr Gillespie. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, in front of you is an update on the risk management profile for Council. Again, I'll, I'll take the report as read, noting paragraph 14 of the report, which updates the committee on the risks that have been classified as some concerns, um, and also a new presentation style um, in Appendix 2, whereby the updates are highlighted in yellow, just to make it easier to see what's changed from the last report. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. I, I would like to say that I thought the presentation was excellent, much, much easier to follow and well done. Much appreciated, thank you. Questions or comments, please? Councillor Buswell. Thanks, thanks for the report. I'm just, um, I'm just interested in the climate change lens across everything um, <clears throat> that we do in terms of assessing risk and things. And it crops up quite a bit um, subtly through, throughout. But I, I think that um, it would be interesting to see how the um, sustainability and resilience team feed into this. Um, obviously, it's very important for them because that's what their primary focus is. Um, and considering we have adopted um, a climate emergency and so forth in our council, I think that um, I, I would quite like to maybe hear through this, through this um, audit and risk forum from the sustainability and resilience team to see how things are flowing and, um, and to see how they are working across the organisation to um, to make sure that that risk is, is highlighted. Through you, Mr Chair, yeah, that's something that we can we can definitely um, look into. They do feed into the updates, and um, the updates mainly come from the from the GMs, um, but they do go to their staff as well for updates um, if, um, in these areas. But yeah, we can definitely do that. That would be great, because it's a forever changing um, environment for sure. Oh, literally, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, 
Councillor Holborough. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I talk with that comment from uh, Councillor Buswell. Completely agree about um, embedding those climate change risks across everything. So um, I was just looking at the at page forty eight around iwi relationships and um, just the treatments to reach target risk level seem a little bit a little tiny bit thin to me. I'm wondering about um, adding something around embedding tikanga Māori into our projects and our activities, and also maintaining a strong iwi partnerships team, something like that, because there's a little bit more going on than is highlighted in the yellow there. Um, any comments around that? And then I've got another one. Yeah, three, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, absolutely. So when I come to do my um, next report for the next committee meeting, and um, when I speak to the group manager for people partnerships, I'll definitely raise those and we'll try and add in a few more treatments to, um, you are right, there's more going on in that space. So yeah. <laughs> I don't think it, it reflects the, the, okay. hard, the hard work that's going on in, in that area. Um, the other one was a, a kind of moderate, moderately low risk but I just I, I just didn't quite understand the page on new asset operational deficiencies what kind of assets are they because I'm not sure how it relates to the open spaces strategy and the subdivision design and principles view well that's page 58 sorry I'll, I'll have first go while Andrew's getting to the page. Um, look, that, that, that relates to developers who, who are vesting assets to us largely that, that, that they have built. And um, we need things like the SDPR, which obviously is being reviewed at the moment, to set the standards for quality um, that those assets need to meet in order to be handed over to us. So we still have instances that I hear from Sean and the team of receiving assets that simply are going to fail or are going to be very, very expensive to maintain. Um, and so a lot of it comes back to the work that's done at the beginning of, of uh, development, um, but it also <laughs> relies uh, heavily on them doing what they agreed they would do, um, which can be a challenge sometimes. Thank you. That clarifies that. Thanks a lot. Councillor Compton. Um, thank you. Through the chair, a slightly tangential question, I think, um, but sort of relating to the overall sort of uh, risk focus of this paper, is the Auditor General published their findings in terms of their survey work they did on uh, local government last year uh, in October. And I was wondering, um, had our risk team had a chance to review that and were there any of the Auditor General's sort of observations about some of the uh, issues within risk management practices within local government that you're looking to incorporate into our risk register or practices within the organisation? Uh, for you, Mr Chair. Um, so I guess um, this the, the work that's going on in the risk space um, is I'm new to the role and um, so we've and got a dedicated person in this role so the plans in the next 12 months for sure is there's going to be quite a bit of change in the presentation style as well um so these kind of things will definitely feed into their um just at the moment we're just kind of setting things up behind the scenes at the moment but yeah um definitely on the horizon that, that was that that's good because i think one of the uh, findings out of that was um about the need for councils to have dedicated risk people so you've already yeah, at least yeah. ticked one box there i guess from that report so that's good to hear yeah Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, a pretty full report and uh, gives you a fright, doesn't it, when you see all the risk? You think, well, we're doing anything. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we have a recommendation, which is on page 39, which I will move. A seconder, please. Councillor Holper. All in favour? Good. No one against. 
we have all in favour, Mr Chair. Thank you. Treasury compliance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're getting a lot of uh, a lot of exposure here today. I'm a bit worried. <laughs> okay, so this is the, um, the the quarterly Treasury compliance to December, and in summary, um, we've just continued it over the quarter with our usual approach of drawing down, continuing to draw down regular increments from LGFA to support our cash flows and continue with the pre-funding um, strategy that we have in place, as well as during the period we repaid one, one maturity, um, the October 21 maturity. So as at December, we had net debt of $162 million, which equated to 171% of operating income. That compares against our, um, our limit of 280%. And sitting in behind that net figure, we had gross debt of 250 and term deposits of 70 million. So the 70 million is largely about um, holding funds uh, to, to pre-fund the future maturities that are coming up. We're 100% covered against the May 22 maturity and the October 22 maturity. And we've now started building up against um, the April 23 maturity. So we're just continuing that program of covering up to 18 months in advance. And we also hold 20 million of um, pre-funding against future CapEx spend that we expect to happen. Um, in the event we know our CapEx program this year is gonna come in below budgeted levels in the event that that CapEx pre-funding is not required, um, we'll just reapply it to maturity pre-funding. So we'll just repurpose it basically. Um, the report um, includes uh, reports on our various control limits that we've got in our treasury policy. So there's a series of controls around maturity profiles and um, counterparty risks and borrowing limits, et cetera. And um, we're compliant with all of those um, limits during the period. So I'm happy to take any questions. One from me, Ian, and uh, it's probably in the report and I didn't pick it up, but Future interest trends, are we seeing anything worrying? And in, in, I know we've got a pretty good program locked in, but uh, I'm hearing all sorts of things around interest rates at the moment. And have we got any real concerns over the next few years? Well, um, we're obviously watching what's happening. I mean, the main point is that we've got um, our swap book, so we, we're pretty well covered. We're covered to 86%, I think it was, so 86% of our, of our debt book is effectively fixed through our um, swap program. So that gives us a lot of um, certainty in the near term. Those swaps run out, some of them up to 10 years. So we've got a high level of um, uh, fixed um, interest in place. At the same time, we're always looking to refresh. So that there's about 40 odd swap contracts making up the total book and they're all maturing at different times. So they will quietly expire and um, waste away over the coming years and so we'll be looking to replace those in due course and we're watching that. We've got um, our advisors Bancorp or our treasury advisors and um, their view at the moment is that actually fixed interest is overpriced in the market so they don't actually believe that um, rates will increase to the levels that the market are pricing in at the moment um, and you know they've got they've got various reasons for that. Um, uh, but basically, they think there's negative risks, I guess, that are not currently factored into the to the market pricing that we're seeing. So their advice at the moment is to sit tight um, and just just see what happens over coming months. But we'll certainly need to be making some decisions around purchasing new swap contracts as the year progresses. Thank you, Councillor Compton. Oh, sorry, I think Mark has a comment. Through you, Mr. Through you, Mr. Chair, look, I also wanted to um, just add a small bit to what Ian said. So um, what, what Ian was saying, look, you know, in turn, we have a swap book which um, will do what it's intended to do, will protect us against rising interest rates. But actually, there's a positive. There is actually a positive to interest rates rising is that in terms of our pre-funding program, the term deposit rates are going up as well. So that, that works in our favour. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, thank you. Through the chair, we've obviously 
our CapEx program for this year is behind what we were planning for it to be. Um, so how's that having an impact in terms of the debt we're drawing down? So we, I would expect we will not end up drawing down the, the level of debt that the LTP anticipated. I mean, it goes, it goes hand in hand. If we're 20 odd million down um, on CapEx, then I'd expect our, our ending uh, net debt will be similarly down. And so we just, yeah, so we're managing towards that as each renewal comes around. So I guess the follow-up question of that is, I guess that's being balanced in terms of uh, pre-funding as well, so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. And Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and so as I say, we've got, um, we, we are holding 20 million of pre-funding against anticipated CapEx. I personally don't think we're going to need all of that because the CapEx isn't going to um, eventuate to the level um, we budgeted. So as I say, what we'll do is just repurpose that 20 against future debt maturities because essentially all it is is money sitting on a term deposit and all we would do we've got we've got that money those two we've got 20 million dollars that um are on term deposit maturing in the next couple of months when they when those maturities come around that money will come into us and i'd suggest we'll probably look to roll it out against future maturity so we'll just put it back on term deposit again yeah yep. thank you Councillor Holbrook. Yeah, congratulations on another very good uh, Treasury report. I'm just wanting to, uh, a reminder, when are we next having a Standard & Poor's rating review? They typically come around in June, I think it is. Cool. June, Thanks. July. I'm ga I gather we're on track to maintain at least our current rating. That would certainly be the goal. We're hoping we can uh, we can move it off the negative watch. You might recall last year we went from AA stable to AA negative outlook, which was basically driven by the level of capex um, that we had and had planned ahead of us. So we're hoping uh, this time round with the adjustment to capex, and we're certainly working hard on things like pre-funding, making sure we've we're as liquid as we can be. We our goal is to hopefully improve that. Excellent. Thank you. And Mr. Simpson. Ian, is the gap between what you're paying for pre-funding and what you're getting for term deposits widening? It's still positive. So we are um, able to make a, um, a positive margin, I guess. Um, and so what we've been doing recently is um, with the pre-funding, we've, we've been borrowing it floating and placing it on term deposit. And so the floating rates at the moment are uh, um, 1.8 or something like that. And the term deposit rates are more like 2.5. Now, the floating rates we're all expecting to, um, to click upwards, they get reset each quarter, but nonetheless, there's a, there's a positive margin in there. So I'm confident at the moment we're not, it's not costing us to pre-fund. Okay, thank you. So Ian, one last question. You've withdrawn our investments in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they've been closed out. <laughs> All right, no other questions. We have a recommendation on page 66. I shall move it a seconder, please. Councillor Buswell. Councillor Buswell. All in favour? All in favour, Mr Chair. All achieved. Thank you very much. All right. Progress on audit control findings. Thank you, Mr Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, in front of you is a progress update on the audit control findings for financial year 2020 and um, that paper was brought to you at the last audit and risk committee meeting. So this is just an update, and we're going to bring these updates to every every committee meeting just to show the progress where we're at. Um, I'll take the report as read, and um, noting paragraph seven updating the committee um, on the progress of these audit control findings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have just one question, um, Andrew. Would it be possible to just add a column with some target dates down the right-hand side so that we can 
sort of have a bit of a focus on when uh, when we might want to get these things tidied up. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, these these control findings, so they they can only be closed out. So even though some of the progress might say that we've maybe improved in that area, they won't officially be closed out until um, Instant Young come in conduct their end of year audit. Um, so yeah, so we can definitely add that column in um, for future reports, um, but that gives you a bit of an idea of when they can actually be closed off as well. Thank you. No, I can't see any other questions, Danica. Sorry, Mr. Chair, no, no other questions. All right. Uh, I shall move the recommendation on page 75. And Councillor Hober is seconding. Thank you. All in favour? And that's all in favour. Thank you. Motion, recommendation accepted. All right, we have uh, confirmation of our minutes and uh, a recommendation on page 79. Do I have a mover for that, please, for that recommendation? Councillor Buswell. All right, all in favour? And the seconder is Councillor Holbra. Or do you have a question? Sorry, Councillor Holbra. Seconding, awesome, thank you. All right, all in favour. Thank you very much. We in favour, yeah. Okay, so now we have to move into public excluded reports. Would someone move we do so, please? Councillor Holbra and Councillor Compton, was that a second? Oh, sorry, Councillor Buswell. Yes. <laughs> and Councillor Compton seconding. All in favour? And that's all in favour. Thank you. And if you just bear with me, Mr Chair, while I stop the recording. Okay.